Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I think we have people from uh, multiple countries now. My name is Carrie Johnson, and I'm the director of the IIE Cairo office. I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 IIE Peer Forum on Emergence and the Future of Higher Education in Emergencies. Since 2017, IIE's Platform for Education in Emergencies Response has worked to connect displaced and refugee students to higher education opportunities while raising awareness on the global higher education and emergency crises. The forum has been planned to increase our understanding, to exchange best practices, to encourage collaboration globally. I'll be moderating today's forum. This is our second panel, uh, which will focus on the Middle East and Africa. Today, we have with us three individuals who bring with them a wealth of diverse professional and uh, personal experiences. I'm looking forward to an informative and lively discussion and around issues of importance to displaced and refugee education in our region. We're gonna start our session with opening remarks and then each of our two panelists will present for approximately 10 minutes. And this will be followed by a moderated panel discussion and then questions from attendees. Given the size of the group, microphones are gonna be muted for the duration of the session, but please feel free to type any questions that you have into the question box at any time. So now I'd like to introduce our opening speaker and panelists in the order that they're going to be speaking. Karam, Manel, and Sammy, can you please turn your cameras on? Okay, so our opening speaker, Karam al Hamed, is the founder and CEO of ZFI and a former IIE scholarship for Syrian students recipient. Karam is a human rights activist, photographer, policy advocate, and international development professional. He joined the Syrian uprising against the Assad dictatorship and helped in documenting the atrocities with his camera. He created and managed several local Syrian media outlets since 2011. And as a photographer, he's worked with AFP and Reuters. Karam holds a BA in International and Global Affairs from Bard College, and he is broadcasting today from Berlin. Our first panelist is Manel Stulgatis, Education Officer with the UNHCR. She currently oversees the UNHCR's tertiary education portfolio and this includes work on inclusion of refugees in national educational systems, accountability, higher education scholarships, education transitions and protection, humanitarian development approaches, and complementary education pathways for refugees. Her professional expertise is in refugee protection, including durable solutions, urban displacement, child protection, and coordination. Manel has a professional degree in law and a master's degree in international law and economic development, and she served in civil society, UN research and consulting roles throughout the Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and parts of Asia. And Manel is joining us today from Copenhagen. Our second panelist is Sami Al Ahmed, CEO and founder of Khatwa and Marja. Sammy is coming to us today from Cairo. He's a Syrian entrepreneur who envisioned and founded Khatwa, supporting Syrians through higher education opportunities and Marja, which is MENA's number one platform connecting youth to scholarships, opportunities and universities around the world. Sammy is very active. He's a fellow in the AMENS program at Stanford University, a member of Changemaker times Change community, and a global shaper at the World Economic Forum. As a talented growth hacker, he was able to increase his platform's traffic in two years from 25,000 per month to 2.5 million per month. Uh, welcome, Kara, Manel, and Sammy. We're really excited uh, to hear what you have to say today. Um, so now, Karam, it's, it's, uh, the floor is yours to give your opening remarks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you so much for, for the lovely introduction. So my name is Karam. Uh, I'm an IIE alumni. I've, uh, as Kerry was mentioning, I'm mostly uh, interested in human rights activism. And I've been a human rights activist against Assad since 2011. I'm sharing with you right now just uh, some art that has been done uh, or 
another project that I'm working on right now to at least visualize my experience as a, as a student, a previous political detainee, and most recently a CEO of Z5. So in 2011, I was uh, studying in uh, my third year of petroleum engineering uh, when the Syrian uprising against the dictator Bashar al-Assad started. I joined it and started working in documenting uh, the atrocities the government was committing against its own people. During the very the first five years of the Syrian revolution, I was detained for four times. Last one lasted for one year in one of the most horrifying jails in the world. It's called Palestine Branch. Uh, forgive me if I'm just skipping uh, so long because I don't want this, I don't want to burn it up because uh, I'm hoping that people would be looking into this website later on uh, once it's released. So it's not released yet, but um, the whole idea is my experience in human rights activism and jail. Uh, I stayed in Palestine branch for a year, as I said. Um, and then when I was released out of jail, um, I was not allowed to continue studying in Syria. Um, so I basically just had to leave Syria. I was forced to flee Syria to Turkey. Back in Turkey, this, this is just an, uh, a visualization of my experience in leaving Syria, leaving jail. Um, so basically yeah, I went to Derizor, Raqqa, Arra'i, and then to Gaziantep. In Gaziantep, I basically uh, started working, continued to work in, uh, in terms of like supporting the Syrian uprising and also like applying for scholarships and education, uh, education opportunities. 2017, I basically uh, received a scholarship, the IIE, to, to continue my studies in the US as a transfer student for petroleum engineering. Um, Donald Trump went out with the Muslim ban where I could not actually go to the US, but basically uh, IIE uh, worked so hard that year in 2017 to provide us with opportunities to study in American schools outside of the US when I went to Berlin. Um, and in Berlin, basically I studied at Bard College Berlin uh, and a bachelor's of economics, politics and social thoughts. For, I graduated in 2020 um, and then I created a startup called ZFI. ZFI is focused on providing interactive vocational crypto education uh, we're a team of over 35 volunteers from all over the world. We're building an academy, an NFT market, um, and a tokenized experiences market. In uh, Z5, basically, we wanted to tackle uh, issues that are related to issues that we, we've seen or came across when we were trying to understand blockchain, finance, economics, and, and cryptocurrency. For one, is the lack of Arabic resources and culturally sensitive content in terms of, uh, in, yeah, in terms of crypto education. And the other hand is lack of awareness uh, of its human and democratic potential. With crypto, I basically felt like I was able to retrieve some of the feelings of autonomy and self-determination that were taken away from me by Assad. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I basically, I don't regret any second. I went out in demonstrations against Assad. I don't regret going against him. If you took me back to 2011, I would have done it again. But this, uh, this opportunity that I was given was uh, changed my life. And uh, there are so many, there are hundreds of thousands of Syrians right now that are in need of uh, educational opportunities. Uh, I. I hope that during this panel, we can tackle down some of the issues in terms of the implementation of some of the programs uh, for education and international education as a whole. But I am, yeah, I hope that, uh, I hope that, I hope that the chances I got would be something that every other Syrian uh, who faced all of these atrocities uh, would be able to have. I think that education is very important for the future of Syria. 
and without me just saying like as so many other people just write in their cover letters we're gonna go back to rebuild syria this is something we're gonna do for sure but also i hope that international programs would be able to basically tackle the idea of not post conflict or post crisis but also what's going on right now inside syria and try to implement some more projects and programs that are focused on justice, accountability, and so on. Yep, thank you so much. I look forward for the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Karim, for sharing your journey with us, um, both verbally and, and visually. It's the images that you shared are really powerful. And I, I think that it, it, it really helps to, uh, to make us really see and, and feel um, that that aspect of, of your journey. Um, I'm, I'm really excited for you and, and hopefully during the discussion you can share a little bit more of what you're going to be doing in the future. Um, and we look forward to, to your interaction in the panel. Um, I'm pleased to turn the mic over now to Manel who's going to share her, uh, her vast experience in refugee education with us um, and sort of give us the sort of a, a, a to frame refugee education for us. Thank you, Manel. Thanks, Carrie. I believe there are slides coming up, but in the in the meantime, I just wanted to say thanks to Karam for the great introduction, and I hope that you will find a way to share the link to your um, to your, the website that has your artwork because some of it was really stunning. So thanks so much for sharing that. That was an unexpected treat for me. Um, really, really great. Anyway, it's so nice to to follow that. Um, bit of light. So, right. So I see a few um, names in the participant list that I'm familiar with and um, many, many more that I'm not. So um, this is a great, great forum to be at. And thanks a lot to the organizers and for inviting us from UNHCR. Um, it's, it's just a pleasure to talk about refugee higher education, um, especially to rooms of individuals that are that may or may not be familiar with um, the interventions and the programs and the um, promise and the opportunity. So um, there were there were a couple of things in what Karam said that I wanted to touch on. And one is the front picture here that you see in, in the presentation, which is a group of students um, in East and Horn of Africa. And, and I just wanted to reflect on how how broad a variety of higher education opportunities there are that refugees need access to. So we saw in the context of the Syrian crisis where opportunities for tertiary education really became um, scrutinized and under the, under the spotlight and more opportunities opened up because of the magnitude of, of very highly educated individuals who were fleeing from Syria. And I, and I just was reflecting on this where, you know, some of our largest scholarship programs are actually in Africa and specifically in East Africa where the context for, for learning is and appears so, so different. And I, I just think it's, it's really worth highlighting and I will get into it into the presentation later that there are so many ways of accessing higher education. So Karam was talking about um, initially planning to go on scholarship to the US and instead finding a different solution, going to Berlin. Many students are, are you know, taking part in education that's offered in a different country via connected or blended or online um, modalities. Um, others are, are actually able to make that journey. So we'll talk about that more in the presentation. So in any case, all of that is to say, thanks to everyone for joining and let me just jump in here. So I'll start off talking about 15%. Um, in, in 2019, UNHCR uh, issued our education strategy for the next 10 years. And in it, um, we compare primary and secondary enrollment for refugees to average national enrollment. So our objective is to achieve parity at primary and secondary level. So children, refugee children should be studying at the same participation rate of nationals. And that's where we talk about inclusion in national systems. And that's what all of us um, within UNHCR and, and our partner organizations are, are geared towards to the extent possible. Now, tertiary education or higher education is a different beast entirely. So where we see um, participation rates for, for refugees in primary and secondary creeping up, um, tertiary remains very, very low. So only 3% of refugees currently are enrolled in higher education that we know of. And, and our data is very patchy. 
um, and we're working on bolstering it, but, but indeed tertiary remains very low. And so we can't at this point anticipate that refugee participation in tertiary will be on par with, with non-refugee populations, um, which the figure stands at 37, almost 38%. So the objective that we set in the education strategy is to achieve 15% enrollment. So over the next 10 years, we intend with our partners and with national governments, home governments, um, resettlement countries, et cetera, to achieve 15% enrollment of refugee men and women in higher education by the year 2030. And that's equivalent to approximately half a million individuals enrolled. Right now, again, just to say we're at 3%, it's very, very low. Access is very limited. Um, investments and funding for higher education for refugees is, as you can imagine, not a priority um, when it's placed next to the importance of enrollment in primary education and secondary education. So we're very realistic about that. Um, you know, the rights for children to access education certainly come first, but the importance of higher education and the, the sustainability, the durability, the importance of that investment cannot be um, overstated. Can I have the next slide, please? So just to quickly touch on um, some of the strategic objectives that are outlined in the education strategy. So here again, in point one, you see inclusion in national education systems. So just, just for those of you who are not aware, you know, for many, many years, um, education for refugees was provided in the context of refugee camps. As we've seen refugee situations or displacement situations become increasingly protracted over the last several decades. Now we have a situation where most refugees are in a displacement situation for multiple education cycles, which means that you have young people who go through primary and secondary education in displacement and need access to tertiary. And this became very, very apparent in the, the situation of this, uh, the crisis in Syria. So um, when we're talking about inclusion, we're talking more and more about this responsibility to share um, the burden with host countries in terms of making access to education available for more host community students alongside and, and including refugee students. So now we're talking about including refugees in national schools alongside host community students. Um, number two is fostering enabling environments that support learning and that really speaks to quality. Um, and then three is enabling children and youth to use their education to, towards sustainable futures, which has everything to do with acquiring the skills and knowledge that allow individuals to not only grow and thrive, but also to transition um, to work if that's what they want or transition to higher education and beyond if that's what they want. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see, these the strategic objectives build on each other. And again, so here we see on the left side of the screen, you see um, the progression through primary, then there's a big drop off to secondary, and then there's another big drop off to higher education. And, and so um, from, from our side, from the tertiary education side in UNHCR, when we come in at higher education, we have both a backward looking piece. So looking at supporting refugee students to complete secondary and make that transition to tertiary. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those challenges and solutions in a minute. And then also we have a bit of a forward looking focus. So looking at how can we make higher education actually result in outcomes in sustainable solutions in um, transition to employment, et cetera, for refugees. And, and to say one of, again, one of the barriers that I'll come back to later is that access to the labor market, um, so the right to work for refugees is highly restricted. And there are, you know, sort of a, a minority of host countries where refugees have access to work. And that's obviously a challenge for um, for higher education. You know, individuals are investing time and money and um, family resources, et cetera, in their education, unclear about whether or not they're actually going to be able to move into a career that corresponds to their field of study, their ambitions, their skills, et cetera. On the right side, you see a figure. This is a very recent figure. Um, the Malala Fund uh, conducted a survey or a piece of research during COVID. And, and so this speaks very much to the current situation where we see that um, as classrooms and schools around the world have closed um, and young boys and girls have, have been forced to go home from secondary school, um, because of all of the factors that deprioritize or make difficult um, girls' participation in education, uh, it is, it's estimated that 50% of refugee girls who stopped going to school during COVID will not return. Next slide, please. 
So from here, we're going to jump right into higher education. And I would like to start on the right side, actually, where you see the blue and green shapes. Um, and when we're talking about the 15% the objective, what, we're, what we've developed at UNHCR and with our partners is what's called the 15 by 30 roadmap. And it's, um, it's a plan, it's a strategy to take us from 3% where we currently stand to 15% enrollment in the next 10 years. And the way that will happen, I've talked about the variety of, there is a variety of ways that uh, refugees access higher education. And here you can see the five different pillars which are the main pathways that refugees are participating in higher education. So on the dark blue, you see traditional in-country university enrollment. And this is enrollment in national, public or private um, education institutions in the host country. Um, then in the blue, you see the, what's called the DAFI Tertiary Scholarship Program. That's UNHCR's scholarship program. So that's a scholarship, uh, full ride scholarship program that we've been running for almost 30 years now. Um, in 53 countries around the world. Every year for the past uh, three to four years or so, we've had roughly sort of between 7,000 and 8,000 students enrolled in this program and it's, it's slated to grow. Um, it's a very important program for us. It's often used as a model for the development of, of other tertiary scholarship programs for refugees. Um, and it, will, it is part of the 15 by 30 strategy, but as we'll see over time, those really inten resource intensive full ride scholarship programs will actually constitute a, a minority of the enrollments when we get to 15% and the bulk of the enrollments are gonna take place again through this inclusion strategy, through enrollment in options that, um, that allow refugees to participate in national education systems alongside host community students. Then at the top, we see third country scholarships, and this is um, a durable solution that links higher education opportunities to a third country institution. So um, with third country education pathways, which we also call them, um, oftentimes it's a collaboration between civil society organizations, receiving states and higher education institutions to create scholarships that would allow a refugee say from Uganda to apply to study their undergraduate degree in Canada. And in the ideal situation, these third country scholarships mean both access to a degree, but also to a durable solution. So the, the legal ability to remain in that third country and theoretically enter the labor market um, you know, have their family join them and, and spend a, a, the rest of their professional life as they wish um, there. This is a very small number, as you can imagine. This is, a, this is a minority of the enrollments at this point. There's a lot of energy and effort and motivation into expanding third country scholarships or what are called complementary pathways. You'll hear this term um, around. Um, and, and we see some great examples of complementary pathways, uh, programs that exist from Japan to um, several countries in Europe, to Brazil, to uh, Mexico and the US. So all over, um, we've got some examples that are starting to gain traction. Connected higher education, again, um, falls in the traditional in-country university scholarship pillar, but it involves online or blended learning. So these are on, certified so accredited online programs this is not we're not talking about short courses we're not talking about one or two courses via coursera we're talking about an actual degree program and then technical and vocational education and training is also an in-country option and involves usually it's a two-year degree program that you're probably familiar with and is considered a very direct pathway to um, to employment. They're tied often, the technical and vocational curriculum is tied to labor market gaps. And um, we're working right now very intensively to, to expand refugee access to TVET. So on the left side, now we can quickly run through the barriers, um, some of the barriers to, to higher education, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Um, so there's cultural limitations, and I would highlight some of those specifically around um, prioritizing girls' access to education, and that's not only secondary, but especially at tertiary education. So once you get to tertiary level, you can imagine that the pressures on girls in many contexts to get married, to um, you know, enter motherhood, to be at home doing domestic duties, um, or simply a, a lower expectation that girls will participate in higher education means that there are fewer girls, um, refugee women enrolled in higher ed. 
Um, then certainly there are language issues when when the language of instruction isn't doesn't correspond to the refugees first language. Um, gender inequality I already spoke of lack of certification or inability to recognize prior learning is a big issue. I'm sure many people have encountered this um, when working with refugee students. Um, legal restrictions I touched on briefly. Um, the remote location issue comes up a lot when we're talking about connected higher education and specifically in the context of COVID. When schools closed and some refugees were forced back to refugee camps or simply um, back into communities where they did not have either hardware or connectivity or online teaching and learning materials. Um, and, and in remote locations, that's particularly acute. And then I just wanna stop, uh, my last piece will be on the tuition fees. So. While all of these barriers, you know, depending on the context, one can be more pronounced than another, but the high tuition fees, the cost of higher education um, really does stand out as the as the biggest barrier that most refugees will will highlight. Could I have the next slide, please? So here I'm just going to talk really briefly about our scholarship program, the UNHCR uh, scholarship program that's funded primarily by the German government. Um, as you can see, I cited most of these figures already. I want to highlight again um, the 40% enrollment of women. So regardless of years of uh, emphasis on increasing female enrollment. Um, we've got, you know, some of our biggest program countries where we've got a thousand students enrolled, for example, in Ethiopia, the female participation rate is is stubborn and low. Um, so it remains it remains a priority. But for all of the reasons that we've been talking about, it does remain very low. Um, I also want to point to the top five fields of study. And this uh, these are figures from 2019. We're still compiling our 2020 figures. But these five fields are pretty consistently at the top. And in in the UNHCR scholarship program, um, students are free to choose whatever major that they qualify for and would like to enter. There's no limitations. And yet you can see that consistently students are directing them towards very high employability fields. So they're doing their research, they're recognizing um, where they want to be investing their time and energy um, in terms of what they envision for their futures. Um, next slide, please. So on this um, next, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the gaps. I think I think I've actually mentioned most of these already. So the secondary to tertiary transition. Um, I just want to highlight one of the really interesting, great practices that we're working with um, uh, on our with our partners on in terms of the transition to tertiary. And we've we've learned from refugee students that there are a couple of ways, really simple ways to invest in that in supporting that transition. And one is access to information. So refugee students are consistently telling us that um, they're getting information about higher education and scholarship programs via social media and that a lot of it is is fraudulent or ambiguous, unclear, um, et cetera. So um, assisting with creating links to, to clear, um, accurate information has been a really great step forward. And, and you've seen it. There are a number of different, I, I think IAE has a platform. Um, there are a number of other platforms that have, were talked about earlier um, in terms of making information available um, so that refugees can efficiently access opportunities that are available to them. Um, UNHCR recently launched what's called the Opportunities Platform, and that makes information available both about um, opportunities in country, as I refer to them, so in the host country, the first host country where, where most refugees are, and then also opportunities to access those third country education pathways that I talked about. So I would encourage you to take a look at that if you have a, a chance. And then the other thing that we're working on is um, uh, several of our partners do um, counseling. So have, have identified refugee graduates who are now trained as college guidance counselors. And they work very closely with secondary students um, to say, hey, don't forget, you have the option to continue on. You, you are qualified. You've shown that your grades are, you know, your marks are very high. Um, if you've got the ambition, we can help you find a scholarship, an opportunity, something that matches your language requirements, your degree ambitions, et cetera. And, and that, that counseling service has proven to be very, very important, especially for girls aiming to make that transition or who are able to make that transition to tertiary but don't know how to or don't know that it's available to them. 
Um, and then just to touch quickly on the transition to employment issue. So there are there are a number of ways to engage on, on this issue. One, of course, is what many scholarship and academic programs do um, in terms of providing career readiness training, internships and apprenticeships. The other ways are advocacy about increasing access to the right to work for refugees and also working with alumni to build those networks, strengthen those networks. Um, many, you know, graduates have, have are entered have entered into professional positions where they have weight to throw around where their their opinion matters um, in terms of looking for ways to open up access to to work for refugees. Um, I already spoke about COVID and girls, I think, quite a bit, so I won't spend any more time on that. And if I could have the next slide. And this again um, talks about the roadmap, so the 15 by 30 roadmap. And we look at a number of different ways that we're engaging across the, the five pillars. And I just want to iterate, reiterate here that you know, most of the work that UNHCR does is with partners. Um, and and through not, and it's not only partners implementing UNHCR programs, it's really our work is to find those partnerships, those strong partnerships, and find and look for ways to amplify them, um, look for ways to support them, scale them, replicate them, etc. And I and I think about that specifically in terms of the college guidance counselors models, um, in terms of some pathways models. So the work that we're doing on educational pathways is very much about connecting. Um, partners that are providing those pathways already and partners that want to and need to learn and need the, the skills and the examples of how to do that. Um, the policy and advocacy piece is incredibly important. And, and um, so I said a little bit earlier about the difficulties around data reliability for tertiary education enrollment for refugees. And indeed, um, this is one of the areas of priority for UNHCR specifically, because we are often the holders of um, data about refugees specifically. And when it comes to tertiary education, once again, we have to rely on our partners because we do not provide, um, you know, refugee schools, obviously. And so it, it is incumbent upon us to go to the ministries of education, the academic institutions themselves, the scholarship providers and refugees in order to consolidate that information and have um, a reliable picture, um, an evidence base and a platform on which we can build our advocacy agenda and our advocacy strategy to, to try to make more um, opportunities available if we are to achieve that 15% and beyond. So I know that I've taken up um, time and I will pass the floor back now, but thanks again. I really look forward to um, your questions and discussions as we go on through the, the panel. Thanks. Thank you so much, Manel, for, for everything that you shared. I think you, you really laid it out well for us. Um, and I know that we're going to have some interesting questions and dialogue um, around many of the points that you, that you raised. Um, now I'd like to move on to, um, to Sammy, our second panelist. I think his tech issues have been solved. The floor is yours, Sammy. Hey. Uh... Thank you again for hosting me, and I'm sorry for the internet connection, but it's uh, it's happened. Uh, so my name is Sami. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of uh, Morja Platform, which is the largest uh, tech platform in the region connecting youth to education opportunities. And also, I'm CEO and founder of Kotwa, help it, which helped like uh, Syrian students co to connect with higher education. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you, and I'm I'm really happy. Like I was enjoying what Karam and Manal said, and I have a lot of stuff that I can. It's it's uh, I will talk about it, but a little bit from um, different pr perspective. Uh, so, uh, can we go for um, our first slide? So like this is my, a picture of uh, my friends in my first year in Syria, um, my first university year in Syria. Uh, like when we was talking about uh, people who, who wasn't able to continue their education, it's a little bit um, a numbers. Uh, but for me, this picture uh, is a reflection on these numbers because unfortunately most of this so that, like my my friends wasn't able to 
to continue their like their life and uh, they like forced to travel most like most of them now in different countries across the world um, so and and I, I believe like I, I always consider myself lucky to be able to continue my higher education uh, but like I, I traveled from from Syria to Egypt in 2012 and I'm traveling from uh, like uh, Arabic country to Arabic country. Um, uh, but when I traveled to Egypt uh, without any previous information, without any knowledge about the country, um, I wasn't able to to know a lot. Like I just find myself in a new country with no network, no family, no friends. And I was like trying to search for university to accept me. But it was a quite challenge because like the system for for uh, foreign people who want to apply for universities to study in Egypt is different from Egyptians. So I don't know any foreign people and Egyptians can't help me and I don't know where to start. So I got loose. I missed uh, the deadline for the application uh, and I was like in very bad situation mentally like I, 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 I lost the hope of the, of the ability to continue my education. I have no one around me and I am in a new country. Um, it was very hard time on me. Um, I was lucky after it, it too because they end the deadline for three days and I, I was lucky to know it from like by total accident um, to know that they extend the, the application and I applied and, and I started my, my education. But I always remember this moment. Uh, what is one of the most problems that we have, not just the access to information, is actually is the hope. Because after facing a lot of problems and a lot of challenging, Having a hope is not an easy, easy ability. Um, and most of us have gone through a time that uh, we felt there are no hope anymore. And without hope, we can't do anything. Even with a lot of support, a lot of helping, a lot of uh, um, NGOs, companies trying to help, but you, you will feel like you ha you don't have any motive anymore. So it's very hard. So after feeling that I felt I wanna, I don't want anyone else to, to feel this um, again, what I feel is about getting close and ability uh, and enable to um, find educational opportunity. Um, so after one year, when I started a little bit to know more about Egypt and living there, and I have some information about higher education. I started my first initiative, Khotwa, helping Syrians and refugees who want to study in Egypt to access to information. And we helped thousands of people during the past um, eight years because we started like in 2013. Uh, so we helped a lot of people to access to information and have the support, have the network connecting with other people. And when I started, I was like, I was finding a lot of people helping in the immersion stuff, like uh, living, uh, like uh, food, etc. But there was a few people working in education and. I felt it's it's really a big problem because when we talk about 3% of enrollment to higher education, let's think what will happen when, like if, if the civil war and everything ended now in Syria, how a generation without experience, without knowledge, without education can back to their own country and rebuild it again. It will be a disaster and it could be more damage than the civil war itself. So I believe it's it's our duty um, to to help to prevent this and help to have more uh, people uh, enrolled in the education. Um, after four years of of uh, being working in with Syrians and and refugees to to study in Egypt, I found this a problem of education 
uh, is not about Syrians. It's it's more uh, a global uh, because most of the Arabic countries have a lot of problems with education, and there are a lot of also of Syrians and refugees want to study in other countries. So after that, in um, uh, in 2016, um, I started Marja with my two co-founders, Abdu and Gibeli. And um, uh, Marja is an online platform connecting people to higher education opportunities. And we help them to, to access to information and prepare themselves for knowing whether like if they want to enroll in a university, if they are searching for scholarship, funded opportunities, or want to search for uh, MOOCs and tutoring opportunities. Uh, what amazed me during this journey is the change that could happen when you help someone. This is a small effect of helping someone to be enrolled to education and giving him or her the, the hope again, it totally changed this person's life and affect a lot of other lives. So it's, it's a way of transform, transforming someone who need help to someone who provide help. And that's, that's helped us a lot with when, when, when we started in Khotwa because most of the people who help us in, during the past years who are the people who we helped to, to join. And then they felt, okay, we want to help other people. In the other, uh, in other, in the other side, in, in Marja, it was the same. So if, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, if we will start by, by myself, is I, I like when I, try, when I joined the education and start to knowing more about entrepreneurship and a lot of stuff. I transformed from refugees or like someone need help to an entrepreneur helping others. And I was able to help thousands of people uh, or hundred thousands of people in, in my journey. Uh, and like and now in Marja, for example, we have more than 2.4 million visits per month in our platform helping hundred thousand of people. Um, this images is a few people of we helped to access to scholarship and access to higher education uh, around the world. They are from like Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, uh, Algeria, and different countries. And most of these people now, they have got a scholarship and they started their own initiative. And um, that's what happened with Karam, for example, when he started his initiative now. So investing in one person could change uh, thousands, uh, hundreds or thousands or hundred thousands or even millions sometimes uh, when you invest in this person and change his life. It's not affecting one life, it's affecting a lot because it's the butterfly effect. When you, when someone helped me, I, I got, like I always thank uh, Jusur for, for helping me to know more about entrepreneurship and I believe the opportunity of making me able to, to know more about entrepreneurship and that's make me after that start Marja uh, now helping um, hundreds of thousands, like I said. So it's, it's totally changed life of a lot of people and uh, it's, 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 it's have amazing effect when we, we feel about the effect of each one of this who help now have a company and have uh, employees and help others and this others help others. So it's a great effect. Um, if we go to the next slide. So what we are trying to do now is creating more opportunities and making more collaborations. Um, in Marja, we are a company that's focused a lot on data because it's given us a lot of insights. We have already published two reports about students in MENA region. And by the way, um, the top five fields in MENA region, it's almost the same. The top five fields that uh, Manal talked about in the region, which just with the changing of the orders. Um, engineering was like number two in our statistics, but um, having access to data and understanding the behavior of 
of millions of people um, help us to, to have a different uh, perspective from production of what will happen next, what, what type of graduates we will have in a few years, what type of um, employment opportunities we will need to have, and what type of um, job gaps will happen because a lot of people focusing in other uh, aspects and also have the ability to influence and educate uh, millions of people uh, from the different ways and help them to, to, to discover the different options. Um, because like in our journey, we find, okay, access to opportunity is very important, but a lot of people are eligible for uh, scholarship, available, eligible for a lot of opportunities, but they don't know that they are eligible. Um, it's sort of the hope that I talked about in the beginning. So helping them to find the right match and know what, what is the missing, what is missing to be eligible or they are already eligible and how they can find it, um, it's to have a great effect. Um, so we started now to create, like after observing in, in the past four years and more and accessing to all this million of data, we start observing what is the gaps and start doing more partnership. Um, so I will give two examples. We have made an, uh, a, like a partnership with APU uh, University, the European Business University of Luxembourg uh, to uh, provide um, a scholarship for, for the time being it's for uh, 500 people, uh, will be able to join the same courses uh, that uh, you will take in the bachelor degree, but it's, it will be online and it will be um, a certificate, not a degree. Be like you'll have the same content, but it will be certificate because it's available for people who don't have papers. Um, so it will give a, a, like alternative education. You will have the same uh, education that you will have in your bachelor, which is the most important. It's the degree is important, but like having the knowledge is more important at the end. And also you will have a certificate that you have changed, like you have got just credits, uh, so you can use it in the future. Um, and so this is one of the scholarships that we have worked with EBU and we will announce it officially uh, in a few days. And one of the great programs that's happened also um, Guta Institute have worked with TU Berlin to make a foundation year in Germany and then was in working with Sawiris Foundation in Egypt, they made a scholarship for this program. So it's mixed between German fund and university and institute and the foundation at the same time. And they made a great uh, like a scholarship to prepare uh, students to study in Germany and know how to apply and uh, be able to direct access for universities there. So I, I believe always, um, and I, it's it's sort of call for, for any initiative or foundations uh, who wanna work in education field to work together and share our knowledge and um, information and sort of planning of filling the gaps because uh, when each um, institute working individual, they have uh, like see uh, one aspect and um, a lot of scholarships like focus in one direction, not other direction. So it could be more diverse and could help uh, with working together to match and make better opportunities. Um, so thank you for listening and I will be happy to hear the questions. Great, thank you so much, Sammy, for sharing your experiences and all that you're doing to share opportunities with, uh, with students in the MENA region. Um, I think it's an important point that you mentioned that you, that you started out in the hopes of being able to help Syrian refugee students and then discovered that, that students throughout the region actually need um, access to more information and more opportunities. So thank you for, for all the work that you're doing. So we're going to move on now to our to our moderated discussion, um, and I just want to remind everyone: if you have any questions, um, please feel free uh, to put those into the into the question box so that we can answer those. Um, 
I'd, I'd like to start out um, talking a little bit about how um, access to primary and secondary education um, uh, is, is an important stepping stone into higher education. And that if students know that they're going to have an opportunity to go on to higher education, that this, this can actually help them stay um, in, uh, in secondary um, uh, education. And Manel, one of the things that you mentioned, um, you talked about different barriers that exist. Um, and I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like you to maybe focus a little bit more on what the UNHCR is doing at the secondary level to address some of these barriers um, to then hopefully be able to reach your, your goal of 15% by 2030. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, thanks for focusing on secondary education. It's a, it is a very challenging area of work, I have to say. Um, historically, so much emphasis was placed on primary education and getting children into school as quickly as possible following um, crisis, following displacement, following emergencies. Um, and rightly so, of course. You know, school has a very, very important protective function. Um, and provides often can provide a safe place, um, you know, is, is incredibly important in terms of making sure that the youngest people don't miss or, or end up with a gap in their education because of displacement. Um, when we talk about secondary education, there is a much lower investment in secondary education. There's um, much poorer understanding of how to keep young people in school. And so I'll, I'll just highlight, for example, we know that the vast majority of refugee populations are hosted in countries where they themselves have limited resources available, right? Our low to middle income countries around the world. And so where we, where we can say confidently that not enough refugee students have access to secondary school, we can say that confidently about you know, young people in those host communities as well. And so in that respect, it very much becomes a development challenge. We are talking about, we're talking specifically now about where the humanitarian response overlaps with the development challenges that we face. And, and in this respect, UNHCR has indeed made that pivot to um, to bridging the, you know, I don't want to, again, talk in sound bites, but to bridging the humanitarian development divide and, and understanding really clearly that addressing the secondary retention problem or challenge or creating secondary opportunities for young people is not a question of building schools in refugee camps anymore. It's about making more opportunities available for quality secondary education for all children. And then we, and then again, we're in this, this the inclusion discussion, which is about creating quality, safe secondary schools that host community students and refugee students can access. Um, and so, in that respect, you know, where we have refugee communities in low to middle income countries or in remote areas, there are indeed insufficient secondary schools available. So it's an infrastructure challenge. Um, we do, you know, work with host governments and, um, and ministries of education um, and planning commissions, but also with development actors to say, invest in secondary education infrastructure, invest in secondary education, learning and teaching materials and invest in teachers. I mean, this is the other thing is that, is that salaries for teachers, um, continuous learning and training for teachers, uh, this is not an area that we appreciate enough, right? I mean, secondary school teachers um, are, are in desperate, desperate need and, and they can come from refugee communities as well as host communities. So you see lots of um, efforts now to, to make sure that qualified teachers that come from refugee communities can be hired as bona fide teachers in primary, but also in secondary school. So they're not considered incentive workers or voluntary teachers in refugee camp schools, but that they can be valued resources as part of secondary education institutions. So that's just the tip of the iceberg, but those are the things that I would offer just to get the conversation started. Uh, Sammy and Karim, do you have anything that you want to add on this? Yep. If I may. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Um, just another highlight in regards of this, and it might not tie directly to the idea of uh, secondary education, but more regarding vocational training. Um, yeah, we can paint it flowery and say like, whenever we give opportunities for students, like to get into high school or to get into universities, it's gonna be amazing after that. But in terms of my own experience, and what I saw, I've seen so many people drumming out of schools because of the lack of psychological support, the burden of a cultural shock and being pulled back into your brain in a way. Uh, while actually, of course, yeah, we try so much to push Syrians to get uh, to continue their higher education. It seems like there is also like not so much work in terms of opening it, opening it up for con uh, consultation regarding the left realities. So yes, yeah, it's amazing. I get into a school, I get back to life, I start building my own kind of career in a way, but there's still a reality going back there in Syria. And it's it's like walking while cut in half in a way. I'm I'm there, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to develop myself for a reality after, which is going back to Syria after hopefully Assad is kicked out uh and try to rebuild but at the same time in the reality i'm in right now i'm i'm not being able to cope with it so i've seen so many students given the opportunity to study in a university and then suddenly they drop out because there's not so much psychological support being being like i don't know given to them in their host universities so i think this is one of the shortcomings that i hope international programs in the future would focus more on. I know that IIE have been uh, given some support in terms of that, but yeah, like it's it's not enough to give an opportunity like this. Um, and then tying back to vocational training, which I, uh, this is one of the things that I'm also like, with ZFI as a crypto education and finance education academy in a way, we try to teach people how to how to how to understand the value of their experiences how to present their experiences on chain on the blockchain and how to be able to tokenize it themselves um and then basically like being paid for for that so yeah there's there's only so much that you can give some so many little in a way so little amount of chairs in universities that you can provide for 5 million for example refugees we're all in Syria are eager to study we all want to get into universities. We all were not allowed to study in Syria because of the dictator right there. So finding opportunities where we can actually use the other, I don't know, like, yeah, training them on vocational kind of, I don't know, experiences like, okay, yeah, you want to study in the university, but how about a dual degree, university degree, but also vocational degree that you can use while you can study while working at Deutsche Bank in the U-Bahn or so on. So yeah, uh, that's just what I wanted to respond for this uh, question. Thank you, Karim. You brought, you brought up some really um, some really important points about uh, about vocational, technical, and vocational education, and also um, about trauma and mental health well being. And and I have a question about that 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 I want to discuss with all of you. Um, Sammy, is there anything else that you want to add in terms of secondary education before I, before I move on? Yeah, like, um, yeah, I, I believe it's, it's, it's all important. Like we can't, it's, it's, a, at the end, it's all steps. Like we can't focus in the primary just and forget secondary or uh, secondary and forget higher education because we all continue each other and that's reflect again with uh, working together to 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 have everyone support in a different step. So um, do NHCR saying uh, we are focusing now on the primary and uh, secondary. Someone else focusing on primary. We are so focusing on higher education. So it's collaborate together instead of all of us focusing in just one place. And uh, I believe what is most important that also this is reflect also on what Karam said, whether it's vocational or not. It's um, it's to give a real uh, education and real knowledge, not, not just a certificate. Uh, certificate, we can manage it, but at the end, we need educated people who have the knowledge and have the ability to rebuild Syria. So this is the important, um, not the degree or not what is the different type of, of uh, certificates that I will have. 
Great, thanks, Sammy. I'd like to take it from, look at it from the angle of uh, what happens when students are finishing their secondary education and while they're preparing to apply for universities or to identify scholarships to be able to go on to university. Um, one of the things that, that we've noticed in our work here in Egypt um, with students, um, with Egyptian students, is the need for students to be more prepared to enter university. So many of the students who are coming out of governmental schools um, are lacking some of the academic skills or the language skills that are required for them to be successful in university. So I'd like to, I'd like to ask you all about that. What work uh, is being done or what work is needed to better prepare students to go on, refugee students or displaced students to go on to higher education, particularly when they're going on to study in universities that are not, for example, if we're talking about Syrian refugees, universities that are not teaching in Arabic. So there's the language side of it as well. Um, Manel, would you like to start off with this? Um, I am happy to start, Carrie, although I would I would strongly suggest that there are more qualified um, colleagues here, namely Karam and Sammy, who can speak to this. Um, so I would say just from the concrete work that's happening um, on our side, there, there are so many partners who are working indeed specifically on the language issue. Um, and, and I don't speak only with respect to the Syria context. I mean, it's, this, is, uh, this is a challenge that's evident um, everywhere or in most places and and I guess what I would highlight is that you know there's a lot of um, of effort to assist with with developing language skills but just to underscore the challenge that the that students are facing is when we're talking about university level language acquisition is I mean this is a very very high level of fluency that's required theoretically in a fairly short period of time Right. I mean, they they are um, they're facing, you know, a, a real struggle if if they're starting with a very low level of, of language um, in terms of the language of instruction that they need to to be ready to study in. So, I mean, this is a this is a big challenge, you know, because you can very, very rapidly acquire basic skills, but skills to to pass your TOEFL or your IELTS or your Duolingo test um, are high. And we see this even in the context where where we're seeing scholarships being offered and they they actually cannot get individuals sufficient individuals to apply who can reach that high level of in this case english right where it's where there are really strict requirements about the level of your ielts i mean it, it can be almost unachievable in some in some situations so that's a that's a challenge um I also just wanted to go back to this, the counseling issue, which I think is also related to what Karam and Sammy said about um, psychosocial or psychological or, you know, whatever terminology you want to use in terms of support. So um, a lot of the most important work, at least that I see done by, by, count, by academic counselors and by people who are helping to make that bridge to support students to, to move into tertiary is is about building the level of understanding, but also, you know, sort of the mental preparedness to move into higher education. So not only to navigate the really complex procedures that tertiary education applications involve, right? But then you've got to pull together the pieces of financial aid and where you're going to live and all the, you know, the new environment of campus and um, what campus life is and how to include yourself in all of the services that are available and how easy it is to be excluded, right? How easy it is just to sort of function around the fringes of your academic and, um, life. Whereas, you know, as Sami was saying, getting the credential is one thing, but participating fully in campus life and in academic life, I mean, this is really what higher education is about. And this is why we talk about internationalization in the context of higher education. It's not just getting a degree. You know, you can tick your boxes off and write your papers and get your degree. But, you know, when, in higher education, we're talking about enlightenment and, you know, cross-cultural exchange and all of, and other, other things that are arguably just as important. Um, and being prepared to embrace all of that and take advantage of it and, you know, and find your networks, you know, and take advantage of the social networks when you're in a situation of displacement, you don't have that deep background of social capital, 
that some other students can draw on. And that goes for transitioning into employment, right? They can draw on their, you know, their parents and their neighbors and their dentists and all those um, connections. Whereas um, lots of times, you know, students who are in displacement, they, they don't have that net. Um, so I, I pass over to my, to my colleagues now to respond. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, get, may I also answer? Thanks, Mina. Thank you so much. Um, another thing that is tied to the to the uh, thing that you mentioned in terms of English as a barrier, which is also something that I faced or I saw so many people facing before. Um, in terms of like Syrian refugees or Syrian displaced students, uh, it was already so hard for us to obtain our our uh, certificates from Syria, even or like at least, or most importantly, if we are, if we belong to the opposition or if we're thought to belong to the opposition. Um, so certificates are, are so high, are, are extremely hard to obtain from Syria. But English itself was, was, was a barrier because basically like, you know, that the whole reason for the Syrian uprising or some of the ring, things that are related to why the Syrian uprising have went out are financial in a way. And uh, mostly like wealthy families in Syria are the ones that are able to send their children to Lebanon to study eyelids or TOEFL or whatever, and then obtain these, uh, these degrees and these certificates, which are so important for any university application that you would apply to uh, right after. But this also made it in a way like limited in terms of these opportunities, some of these opportunities to students who are already wealthy to those who are some way or another like already close to the government or were not even affected sometimes by the war, which I don't consider it civil war. As Sammy was saying, I still consider it an uprising and I hope it's gonna succeed one day. But this have narrowed in a way the options for so many students. And one of the things that I found so useful uh, recently or not recently that I saw in some of the universities is actually allowing students to have like, like taken out in a way this kind of barrier in terms of language or like islets or TOEFL because of course, if, you can, if you're in Syria and you can travel to Lebanon without being arrested on the border with Lebanon, then you're in a way or another, like, yeah, it, it, there might be an option that you're actually with the government or that you have not been affected by uh, the uprising in a way. But taking it away and then allowing students to have one year of vocational or like, I don't know what you want to call it, like mentoring in English. Uh, and then English is not detrimental for your acceptance at, at the school at the beginning, but you get into a one year kind of program in a way to study English and to study academic writing. Because I don't want to lie to you, but the way we were studying at schools in Syria are in a way so different than my experience, at least at Bard College Berlin, uh, when I was studying the English writing, the research methods and all of that is so different. So me involved, being involved in a course uh, about academic writing was so useful for me to understand like the, the other language I can actually present my ideas in much more, uh, in a much use, like, yeah, in a much beneficial way or much, uh, I would say like, yeah, representative for, for my thoughts and my mind and all of that. So having this kind of like preparatory, mentory uh, programs as being part of the scholarship, once you are accepted in a school without English being the main, I saw, I saw some universities just considering you have eyelids over 7.5, then you're accepted. But what, what about the others who are actually like, yeah, they're knowledgeable, they have the experience, they have good kind of minds and all of that, but they still didn't have the chance to study English. They did not have money to travel to Lebanon to do it. And they still can provide and bring into the kind of the discourse in universities so much. Um, so yeah, I think introducing these or like expanding on these programs in terms of preparing students for universities as part of the acceptance. So you're accepted in a school, then you are involved in, in, in a program for a year about English and academic writing can be beneficial for both parties in a way. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, I like the idea of I like the idea of a of a preparation year or a bridge year to help students prepare at least in terms of of, of language um, for continuing in higher education. Sammy. Yeah, like I believe is um, having a TOEFL and IELTS is a challenge, but it's not the main challenge of English um, because like it's it's a it's a long topic, but but uh, what I feel is uh, the thing is in Syria we were so addicted to Arabic, so we never used like comparing for me comparing uh, Egypt and Syria. Um, in Egypt, you know, we we use a lot of terms in English. Even if I if I don't speak English, I use a lot of English terms. Um, in in Syria, that's not happen, and in most cases. When you use English word, it's sort of you are irrespectful to the someone you are talking with. So it not makes sense why you are speaking English, why you are using English word. It's 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 fell. Um, you are not showing off or ego or something like that. And even when we are talking about studying English in school, we was like using Arabic. So even in English class in a school, we use like 90% Arabic and 10% English. Um, so there are a lot of fear of practicing. And there are some people who, who know the world. Like for me, I, 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 I was having like background about the main grammars and uh, words. Uh, in English that I can practice, but my English was super bad because I never practice it. Uh, I don't have anyone to talk English. Uh, so I believe uh, practicing and having uh, the ability to speak and like just break this wall of, yes, I can speak. And uh, no matter if I do a mistakes or um, I use uh, uh, slow language or um, I need to use signs, but just practice it, just use it. Um, just knowing the basics and start hearing from people and trying to talk with people, this is will take the person uh, to another uh, level. Um, because unfortunately, the Arabic content is super few. If I want to now attend a course in Coursera or uh, Udemy or etc., it's available in English. So yes, now we have some alternative in draft, blah, 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 but it's very less content. We need more con Arabic content, which is will give a, a totally different uh, privilege for people. Um, even like in now in studying in English, like I, I studied dentistry in Egypt and I studied in English. Um, because still, like the supporting of Arabic language, especially in a lot of stuff, it's 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 not enough. So it's have we need to have more Arabic content, and and we need to make people practice and engage with the English, and then the exam itself it it's solvable because now we have Duolingo. A lot of scholarship now, uh, Chivini, for example, now they are not requiring uh, TOEFL or IELTS anymore. Just if you got accepted from university, it's done. And some universities, they will allow you to have an exam, entrance exam in English, and you can pass it and that's done. So the exam itself, it's not the problem. It's encouraging people to speak and letting them in a, in a way like, uh, I don't know, uh, a camp for, for talk, one week, one month, uh, engagement, you start speaking English and practicing English, not just knowing the grammars, because if you search, most of the people know the grammars, um, uh, it will, will have a great effect. And sure, we need more Arabic content. Thank you, Sammy. You hit on some really important points. Um, a couple of things that, ca that came up in your presentations and, and also now during the discussion um, are things related to supporting and enhancing students' experiences while they're in university. And I'd like to touch on a couple of those things and ask for your, for your input. Um, also in, in, in earlier conversations with Karam and Sammy, um, the issue of trauma and um, mental health well-being came up multiple times. 
Um, and I, I, I want to know what you think scholarship programs and universities can do to better support, to address issues of trauma, to better support students' um, mental health and, and, and well-being. And also, what kinds of things can they be doing to um, engage or include students in the university community? So, Manel, you mentioned... Um, you mentioned that that refugee and, and displaced students off, often feel excluded on their university campuses. So I'd be really interested to have a, a discussion around what is it that scholarship programs or universities can do to better support students while they're in university. Um, Karam, do you wanna start with that, please? Yep, I can start with that. Thanks for this question. Um, in terms of trauma and uh, and yeah, what can uh, scholarship programs do? I mentioned earlier an, uh, an idea about like several students that I saw, which were extremely like, I don't know, they're extremely knowledgeable. They got accepted in the schools. They got the scholarship, money was spent. The like, I don't know, the scholarship, the, the donors supported them and so on. But then within the school, they just dropped out because of the lack of psychological support. Now, um, one of the ideas I think that I just discussed earlier uh, with some of my friends also is like if if some of these funds were tailored or targeted towards actually hiring psycholo psychotherapists within these campuses because I I'm gonna lie to you if I told you like the same kind of conversation I have with the psychotherapist on campus that is German that is coming I don't know from a different kind of cultural background. Is, is the same one when I go to my Arabic therapist, it's different. Um, and basically like, yeah, like just, I don't know, doing some mentoring for these schools, for any school to, to try to go away in a way from tokenizing Bain also to get funding and support from donors. And then for students to feel like their traumas are being depicted and their identities are limited to their traumas and to me being a refugee which hinders me in a way, it's a personal kind of idea, but it hinders me from growing and it hinders me from being able to just integrate into the new reality that I'm in because I'm depicted as that, I'm that. And on campus, some of the campuses in some of the universities, my friends were like, just the refugees, this is the refugee. These refugees get better, better grades, even though their English is bad, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know, some programs that would help and help refugees themselves to try to integrate more into this society and then like spend some money on hiring some psychotherapists on campuses that can actually mentor these students and guide them through this in a way, new reality that they're in. And at the same time, like more capacity building, I would say for universities and schools to try to understand more even, even if like, okay, we're gonna do marketing to try to get more funds, to get more students into the school, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to write down like, hey, this is an event that is done by refugees. Oh, our refugees are amazing. They can create companies, all of that. Yes, but like, yes, okay, let's, let's, let's not just tailor it towards that. Let's use this vein to build in a way rather than just limit us as refugees and as entrepreneurs or whatever you want to call it to refugees. Um, so mentorship for schools and mentorship for students is something I would suggest uh, based on, yeah, based on my experience. Great, thank you, Karam. Um, okay, so one thing, we have about 10 minutes left to go. Um, and there is one thing that I know is, is dear to, to Manel's heart, um, and I think it's really important to, to talk about, and that is um, female participation in, in higher education. And I wanted to have a chance to talk just a little bit more um, about that. What, what can donors, funders, universities be doing to help encourage female participation in higher education? Um, and then if you, if you have a chance also to mention perhaps students with disabilities, what can we be doing better to, to increase the number of students with disabilities participating in, in higher education? 
Is that is that coming to me, Carrie? Um, I have to be very honest, and I feel like we should be asking Karam and Sammy. So I'll say two two sentences. Um, one is that, um, well, uh, the elephant in the room, obviously, is that there's no female student or graduate on our panel, and and she would be the one who would speak to this. So. Um, in her place, I would say that there's loads that we can do. Um, and, and much of it has to follow the lead of the students and the graduates, right? So, so listening to people like Sammy and like Karam and like all of their colleagues is the, is the answer. This is the answer. It's that simple. It's, it's why aren't there women more women in school. Ask them, and they will tell us. And and they have told us, of course. It's all the things that we talked about earlier. It's, um, it's that there are so many competing demands. It's uh, you know on their time and their life and the expectations about the roles that women fill. Um, it's the lack of evidence that shows. You know, we have some really great evidence from the World Bank that talks about the disproportionate. Um, economic benefits of higher edu of completing higher education, right? You complete higher education and the benefits, I must say the economic benefits outweigh any of those that you see from completing secondary education or completing primary education. So we know that, I mean, this is a fact and it's not, it's not um, particular to non-refugees. I mean, this is across the board, right? Having a tertiary education qualification, especially including for women improves child health improves the over, overall economic stability of families. I mean, the the impacts of higher education for women, it, 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 I mean, it really, it can't be refuted. Um, the barriers have to be addressed at the community and the individual level. And this is where we have to listen to, to women and to their peers um, to tell us how to make it more possible. Um, and, it, and that one is not only a financial question, right? This is, a, this is a bigger question about expectations and about ambitions and about making room. Um, and, and so I really, I don't wanna take up um, too much more time other than to say that it is unequivocally a priority for us and across our scholarship program, um, we are, you know, we are, we're trying our best to, to get those participation rates up. And I would say that it holds true for most of our partners. You know, we're, we're now, it's not enough just to say, oh yeah, we want there to be more women in our program. Most of our partners have an underlined policy that says we will achieve parity in participation between men and women. And of course, it's a progressive achievement. It will come, it takes time, but, but, but it's not just an aspiration anymore. It's an absolute commitment. And, and for, for programs to get funding, oftentimes, you know, for fledgling programs or what have you to get funding, oftentimes they have to have a gender equity policy in place that says, no, it's not just an aspiration. We will achieve at least 15% participation of women. And this is super, this is a very, very important um, first step. So, but I, I would pass it over. I would love to hear what Sammy and Karam have to say. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Manel, for pointing out that we don't have a female student um, with us. That's that's a very important that's a very important point. I I I, I recognize that and appreciate that. Um, and I do want to hear from Sammy and Karam on that and and your experiences with your communities. Um, what what do you think needs to be done to increase female participation from your communities? Okay, uh, I was in, a, in from like few days in a in a room in a clubhouse, and it 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 was talking about sending uh, like people abroad, studying abroad, etc. And we was having a parents who send their uh, children abroad, and there was um, people who studied abroad, and I get amazed from the effect of parents on each others because it's. It's totally different when, when, when I am talking about, okay, yes, sending me abroad is very good and it's very benefits, et cetera, but still there are some feeling of the parents themselves. So one of the mothers, she was asking, what do you have felt when you have sent your uh, daughter abroad? Uh, was you afraid? Wasn't you worried? Is it like, because I'm super confused, do, do I need to, to, to keep it on my side or different? And sharing the experience together, because they were saying it's 
it will not make a difference. You will still worry about your child, even if, if, it's, if it's male or female, you will keep always feeling that you want to keep, keep them near from you. And especially now, if, if you talk about studying abroad, it's, it's another challenge. And there was also an initiative um, under our platform, it's like, uh, it, it was called uh, Health Blackages. So it was an initiative like from girls who participate in our uh, like company to other girls to, to share the experience. Because from the other aspects, some girls, they feel that participating in education is useless because the girl will marry at the end and uh, having educated girl will not make a difference. And like to be uh, completely honest and true. So the girl itself, she didn't believe in their own abilities. So she should hear from someone else. And especially if this someone else, a little bit same scenario. So if this girl wear hijab, it's very, it will be very good to hear someone from other girl who wear hijab, he traveled abroad or went to university or the opposite uh, from the same um, like living coast or from near and because they will feel more um, more intimate to this story. Not because if, if I talk and I, they feel, okay, I am uh, someone from the totally different class, totally different mindset, talking about my experience, they will have no clue and it will not be convenient at all. So yeah, there are a lot of initiatives that could be there, but talking directly with parents and talking directly with the girls and sharing this experience and highlight this uh, people. And I don't know if you notice the pictures that I have from the people who, who got scholarship, 68% um, was the females. So I'm, I'm very proud that most of the people who, who achieved great. a scholarship in, uh, in, in, uh, from our side was girls. So it's it's very important topic and uh, I don't want to take a lot of time, but uh, thank you for highlighting. Yeah, and unfortunately we're running out of time. I, I you know, I, I wish we had another half an hour because there's still a lot that that I think that we want to talk about. But actually, where where we're we're ending right now is what was one of the questions that I wanted to ask, and and I'll just say that. Um, Sammy, you mentioned the importance of, uh, of having students talk to each other and having parents share with other parents. And, and, and I think that's really important. And I think that all, I think that you as, as you know, uh, former scholarship students or Sammy, in your case, a student who came from Syria to study in, in Egypt, you've had really important experiences and I think that there's a role for you to be mentors to your peers. And I think that that's a lot of what you're doing in, in the various projects that you've, um, that you've undertaken. But that's also something that I'd like everyone to think about is um, the value there is in, in putting together peer-to-peer -to -peer initiatives and peer mentoring with students, even if students are in their final year, they're mentoring students who come in their first year or in Karam's case where you were talking about the importance of a prep year or a bridge year, making sure that you have older students or alumni who've gone through these types of experiences. They can talk about the trauma, they can talk about their, their well-being, what they did to integrate into their campuses and into their communities, no matter where it is that they're studying. Um, so look to the older students, look to the alumni to serve as peers. Um, in these different programs that that organizations or, or individuals or universities are working on. Um, I'm really sorry that we didn't have a chance to get to some of the questions that are in the question box. Um, and uh, for those questions, if anybody has any other questions or even those questions, please send them to peer at IIE.org and we'll make sure that those questions um, are answered. Um, I just want to take real quickly thank the Catalyst Foundation for Universal Education for supporting IIE Peer, and I want to thank our, our, our speaker and our two panelists, Karam, Manel, and Sammy, for your contributions to the discussion today. Um, the third session uh, will focus on higher education initiatives in, in Asia Pacific. 
and it's going to take place um, for our audience in the US. It's today at 1030 PM Eastern Daylight Time. And for those on Eastern European time, it'll be tomorrow from 4.30 to 6 a.m. I know that's really early. I'm planning on waking up for it. And for those on Indochina time, it's tomorrow 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. So I hope we're all coming away from, from this discussion with some key learnings and most importantly, with renewed passion and, and energy to contribute to, to enhancing opportunities for refugee and displaced students um, to access higher education, to access technical and vocational education or other different types of, um, of opportunities. Um, I know that I'm gonna come away from it with that. Um, thank you again, everyone for joining. Please be safe, stay healthy and continue to make a difference in whatever way you are on this really important topic. Thank you again, panelists. Um, and I hope to see you all on uh, the next session. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, thank Sammy. You. Thanks, Karam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karam. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.